All right, what's up, y'all? This is God Body Science. I'm here today with Drum Machine Addicts at Stankonia Studios. Um, and we are here with the man and the myth himself, DJ Burn One. <laughs> what up, the myth? What's, what's up, up, man? man? How you doing? Hey, no complaints, bro. Thanks um, for having me, man. Oh, man, already. Just uh, just a little bit of background for everybody watching. I actually got a chance to run into Burn One at a studio session up here a couple days ago. Um, heard some of the beats he played from him in the Five Points Bakery. Just, like, insane stuff that we'll get into. Um, Thank you. To kind of get started, though, um, can you tell some of the people who don't know you and your sound, like who you've produced for? Um, I've produced for like ASAP Rocky. I did two joints off his first project, uh, Houston Old Head and Rolling Up. Okay. Um, I did Starlito, Renaissance Gangster. That was the first full project I produced. Okay. Um, and then done a bunch of stuff for Ritz and just a bunch of different artists. Word. And I know, so I'm originally from Atlanta, so... Uh, I had an older brother who was huge in the Gucci. So I remember always hearing your tag around. I would hear like burn one, you know, stuff like that. Um, how did, how did that tag come together? Like, how did you get the name? First of all, too? Um, I just got the, um, the name came from burning CDs actually. Word. Okay. Yeah. Cause I used to, uh, you know, sell different little mixtapes at school and I started selling real albums and then they were just like, burn me one. Burn one. They didn't want to pay the high price for the actual because I got a job at a real CD store. Yeah. So I started selling real CDs. No, I just burned me one because, of course, the burn CDs were cheaper, you know? Yeah. Um, and then the tag came from uh, me and two of my homies from IEP TV, uh, 29 and B. Uh, basically, we were just talking about different tags and things, and they were like, you should put the chronic. It was a guy, uh, J.A. from Macon, yeah. uh, who has passed away. But his... Right. Uh, yeah, our people. In the middle of a song, he just breaks down and says, burn one, burn one. Mm -hmm. And my homie's like, you should put the Chronic uh, match lighting over that. I think it's from the Chronic or Doggy Style. Yeah. And it just happened to go, psh, psh, mm -hmm. like the burn one, burn one. It just sounded good. And okay. so I just put on everything. So I didn't produce anything on Chicken Talk or anything like that. But that was just like my tag to let people know if they're listening to. Because I didn't like talking on my tapes. Oh, that's fair. Okay. I thought that would set me apart if everybody was talking for me not to talk, you know? So what was the, what was the very first placement you kind of had? Um, Renaissance Gangster. Renaissance Gangster. Doing that was? project with them. Yeah. Okay, cool. And like, I know the other night you got to play a couple beats. I won't say who you know was around and stuff like that, but you played a few beats, and um, it got me thinking. I wondered, like, okay, what's the first piece of gear Burn One ever had? Like, what was that thing that you had that got you really started in in production? Just having a PC. NPC? I had, no, just a PC. Oh, a PC. You know, oh. yeah. yeah. Yeah, I just had an HP, just like a regular computer. Mm -hmm. And I got Fruity Loops, and I would just talk on the phone and just make little random drums. Yeah. None of it sounded good, but it was just like messing around while you're talking on the phone in high school. You know, it was just like... Was it FL now? Around. It was FL. I don't know what which one it was. It okay. was one of the early versions. But right. um, just messing around with that. And then, like, years later, I started taking production seriously. Cool beans. I, I remember, like, this had to be, like, 2009. Everybody had, like, the cracked... Like FL, oh yeah, just for sure. Crazy. Definitely didn't buy it. Yeah, <laughs> did you have the? Uh, did you have like the bootleg drum kits that were going around too? Like, oh, this is the official so and so kit. Bro. Oh yeah, yeah. I definitely had all those like Neptune's kit and all those <laughs> different ones, you know. But it was cool. It was just a, you know just experimenting and just mm -hmm. trying different things. So how's your how's your setup kind of changed over time? Like, do you incorporate? Like, I heard a lot of live instrumentation the other night, which I really appreciated. Um, is that is that something that you're focusing on like really heavy these days? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I have three other people that I produce with, mm -hmm. um, Walt Live, Go Ricky Go, and Anna Valina. Okay. Um, and basically everybody contributes, and we all just throw in different ideas and tracks and stuff like that. Like Basically, when I first started, I was just sampling. That's how I learned how to produce. And so, yeah. like, Renaissance Gangster, they sat Rocky stuff, and uh, just a couple others. And those first couple years were, like, all samples. Yeah. And I just, like, went and challenged myself. I was like, I want to make music that sounds like a sample. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? And so I, I just that. went and started trying to learn about music theory and different things. I still don't know too much if I can get along, you know? Yeah. But, um, just learning different things and hooking up with different people, you know? So okay, I linked up with Walt and Ricky and Anna, and it's like everybody just, you know, brings their own flavor to it. It's really interesting. So you started on the PC. Now, um, mentioning your band members or bandmates, uh, the Five Points Bakery, right? Mm -hmm. um, what are you guys kind of working on these days? Um, Walt Live just dropped his first solo album. Okay. Red Velvet Roads. Get that. On all streaming sites? Yep, all streaming sites. Get yep. it. Roads like the piano roads, R H O D E S. Uh, okay. Um but he just dropped his album. Um 
Ricky had uh, album drop last year. And then uh, Anna, we got a bunch of new songs from her about to drop. We just okay. put out a video called Neon Wash. Y'all can check that out now. Neon Wash? Mm-hmm. Okay, yep. cool. And, like, as far as I know you mentioned you guys will get together um, and just throw ideas and see, you know, what works, what the vibe is. Do you do you find yourself starting with roads or starting with drums or how do you kind of or is it is it all just how you feel in the moment that day yeah it's always different you know like okay. if we're all together we all might plug in and just play for 15 minutes and then go in and one of us will grab a loop from that okay. and pitch it up or down and then we'll build a whole composition on that and just like just disregard the other 15 minutes that we play and just build off of that you know it's like yeah it could be that or somebody if we're not together then we'll all just come up with ideas and send them to each other okay. um it's just different every time. So it keeps it fresh not to have like a starting point that's like, all right, I'm gonna do this and then you do that. Like, oh, so there's no everybody template. plays different roles. Everybody can do everything. So okay, everybody just kind of hops in. And so no template, around. just kind of like, hey, let's just let's just jam out, and then like, oh, I can, you know, what? I kind of like this. This might be something. Let's build around this kind of. Yeah, okay. absolutely. So yeah, I might hop on bass and Anna might sing and. Walt play the keys and Ricky play guitar and we all just plug in at the same time or three of us or two of us or just different combinations of all of us and it's always something different so it's really mm, okay it's really interesting so let me ask you this then uh on the note because we talked about a bunch of live stuff what about what about synths are you a synth guy or and if so do you fall on the analog side more or do you fall on software more um I just vi- visited the Moog factory in uh, North Carolina that was really uh, dope. So it was nice to see like the analog side of everything. Yeah, the analog definitely sound dope, but the new ones sound cool too. Like the plugins, mm-hmm. like I love plugins. Like there's ones like the Falcon, yeah, and stuff like that that are like super dope. Um, but you know, I just love all plugins. Can you plug in theme? Can you tell the difference like between like because you? I'll talk to. An I've never side by side done it, but you can hear the analog. It has like a growl and like a warmth and a okay, a depth to it. That word. The average synth doesn't really have for the most part plug in but they're getting better every day like Arturia's theirs are pretty good replicas of the actual keyboards Arturia's cool I feel like uh, not quite ready to upgrade I have like the 5 or whatever I know it's on like 6 or 7 but mm-hmm. like being around here and being around engineers they're like I remember the other day someone was carrying in like a Rhodes uh, like you know big ass Rhodes or whatever and I started talking about the interior collection. I was like, oh, man, it all sounds the same. Engineer popped out of the room. No, it doesn't. It's different. And I'm like, you know, who knows if the... I feel like I don't even know if the listener can hear the difference, but uh, I feel like it, it might have been Ray who was like, they can feel the difference. They may not be able to hear it, but they can feel it. it has this is right energy. there. Yeah. yeah. There's different resonances, you know. Yeah. A lot of times you'll either mic it from an amp or something, so you got the room in it, which makes it just feel totally different. Yeah. You know, it just gives it a totally different feel. So if you had, so with your studio set up right now, I've seen like little bits and pieces, whether you were like doing an interview with Pain or Pain One or anything like that. If you had like a dream setup of like stuff that you could have, whether from like this era or, you know, earlier era, what are some of the things you would probably put in there? Oh man, such a big question. Yeah. <laughs> so There's so much gear out there. It would be so dope. Uh, I don't know. If you ever watch, like, Mixed with the Masters or anything, like, you see Michael Brower's room or one of their rooms, like, yeah, just where they just have everything, you know? It'd be tough like, that's, out. like, the dream, just to have all the racks and all the actual analog hardware and stuff. But yeah. I love plugins. Really, I'd be cool with just a fast-ass computer and just all the plugins, you know? What's your... Maybe a couple, like, preamps and stuff, like a CL1B or something. A CL1B? Yeah. That'd be dope. It's just really great on vocals. So just a couple little pieces like that. Um, and then just, yeah, sounds. What's your what's your go to plugin right now? Um, as long as we're not giving plug-in. away the sauce. No, no, no. <laughs> there's there are no secrets. I <clears throat> I love um the F six for the EQ. Mm, okay. Like I love like how you can control everything and use it. It's like a multi band compressor almost. Yeah. Um, and then I love the instant phaser and instant flanger from Eventide. Uh, uh, there's their bundle. Yeah. You just pay like a monthly thing. Got a bunch of bundles, and uh, those are just really dope. Like you put them on anything, and just make it sound like futuristic and super okay. ill. Yeah, I noticed <clears> a lot <throat> of the uh, a lot of the people who make plugins are moving to monthly subscriptions, and I, I get it's it. It's amazing. You know, yeah, it's beautiful. It's like I wish UAD would do that. You know, <laughs> where I could get all the UAD. Like I love UAD stuff. I hope, man. Like I know they're never gonna do that, but <clears throat> it would be nice. 
Um, we all the subscription like me, DSP, Sam Toys, mm-hmm. um, Ventide. I got the Kush Audio one too. They Kush have a Audio compressor, the okay. uh, AR one. That's really dope. I've never heard of Kush Audio, so I got to check them out. Oh, they're really dope. Yeah, they got a bunch of dope stuff. And it, you said Sound Toys is on a subscription now too. Or? Sound Toys, yeah. Oh snap! Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So if, if y'all didn't know that, check that out too, man. Um, you strike me as someone who might use Omnisphere too. You an Omni guy or no? Uh, I like Trillion. Trillion for bass. Yeah. Okay. So I like that. It's from the same company. Yeah. But I got it, and it just it just didn't really resonate with me. Oh, I'm just so I was then? like, I just swapped it out. I hit him up. I was like, swap it out for Trillion. <laughs> Trillion's great. I yeah. love Trillion, you know? I can, and I can understand, like, the whole thing about Omnisphere, because I have it. I use it. It's like, I use it to start with ideas and stuff like that if I just need, like, you know, you know how it is. You may swap out the sound later, but it can get a little bit annoying to just have that many sounds. It, it It's a great, it's great to have, like, okay, cool, I've got four layers. I can do X, Y, and Z, but after a while, it's like, if I go through 20 sounds and I don't have what I need, I'm like, all right, this is too much shit. Oh, it was frustrating, yeah. yeah. I went through like 40 sounds. I was like, oh, my God. Yeah. I'm sure there's great ones in there. Because I was working with Moby Dick, and he just immediately went and picked something great. I was like, why did I just scroll for 20 minutes? <laughs> I couldn't find anything. And you scroll for like two seconds and find something great. Uh, yeah. So, uh, what about Keyscape? <clears throat> I hadn't tried it yet, but I see great things about it. I've seen it, too. Um, <coughs> and you're not a contact guy either? Well, especially since I use it a little bit. Live. I use contact a little bit. Yeah. They got, like, different uh, strings and different little random symphony sounds and stuff like that. So for the producers who are watching out here, especially with you guys being a band, um, the Five Points Bakery, again, check them out. Uh, would you would you recommend producers, whether veteran or not, uh, learning more music theory? It can't hurt. It can't hurt, yeah. It really can't hurt just to be more informed and understand, like, why certain things work or why they don't, or, you mm-hmm. know. I find it's great now because if I'm like trying to come up with different arrangements to different sections, it helps me move through sections a lot easier. Yeah. Um, it's just overall, I feel like it just helps out a lot, you know? Yeah. I don't know if it's for everybody, but I think it helps out even with me not knowing like everything about it. It's just like, I feel like it just opens you up in different ways that you wouldn't imagine before. Well, I know Monty Booker was on. I, did you see that tweet he put out where he was trying to put people on like the court bot? Um, so there's this company called uh, Isla Instruments. They're making a oh, yeah. yeah, they're making the SP twenty four hundred. Yeah, um, I've been following that, hoping they can send me one to review. But anyway, um, Monty, uh, he was tweeting basically. He was saying like, "Yo, this is like a cheat code. A lot of producers are using. They're using like the Chord Bot to because uh, it saves like different uh, chords. Oh yeah, it's like Cthulhu. It's like a chord um, chord database or something, right? Yeah, yeah and like. Like, I'm supposed to be a gear guy, but I didn't know half of this shit existed. But, like, all that to say, I guess, maybe maybe music theory not is not becoming obsolete, but your knowledge of it, you don't necessarily need to have it. Is is that kind of, like, the, the oh, thing to take yeah, from that, absolutely. so to speak? Oh, you can make something with, like, minimal yeah. knowledge, you know? If you yeah. get a drum pattern down and then pull up one of those. Mm. But it just depends. Sometimes I use them. Yeah, because it's like chords I wouldn't normally use, or just the order of the chords are different. Yeah, and I'll mix it up with different arpeggiators or different things. Um, it's whatever makes it happen, you know. It's like yeah. chords are chords. It's how you use them. That's what matters. The sequence, the the order, how things move from one another, your sound selection. That's really what makes it special. Like, and it's like with those two, you can also play chords and save them in there. You yeah. know, like you don't just have to use the ones that are in there. Like I had Kenny Barto, uh, he used to be a Justice League. Oh yeah, come yeah. through. He came through the house. I was like, "Yo, give me some chords," and he was just like went through and like you press a key and then play a chord, press another key, and so it just assigns the chords to the different key. Yeah, I made like thirty beats out of those chords, you know. So it's like you can also like you know if you're watching like a YouTube tutorial on thirteenth chords or whatever, just jazzy chords, and you're like, "Damn, can't like play them." Just hit and record them in there, you know, mm-hmm. and then you can play them back in a different order. And the joint you mentioned was called Cthulhu, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, Cthulhu. Uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Clearly, I'm I'm like unseasoned because I hadn't I hadn't heard of that before. I didn't know either. DJ Tunk put me onto it. Dude, he was doing some classical sounding beats, which he can just play like that anyways. But I was like, what is that? He's like Cthulhu. It's just hey man, the older, the not even the older, the the last generation be knowing, man. <laughs> oh fuck yeah, he's yeah. a master. I've learned so much just from being around him. Yeah, I got. Little little fan moment, and then we'll get back to it. I got to be around him that same day last week, Word. um, briefly, and like he played some shit, and it was like, whoa, like I, there's still so much to learn, like his placement of chords, like his drum patterns, like you know, there's there's always more to learn, but it's it's great being around the masters because it's like 
I feel like one thing I hear from uh, producers who may send stuff to us is even even learning how to properly use space, you know, oh, yeah. which is like a, a lesson that needs to be learned, you know, but I'm, I'm going to look up Cthulhu now that you mention it. Yeah. So, yeah, it's just fun to experiment with. OK. And like you mentioned earlier as well, too, that uh, you started out on FL. Did you stay within FL or have you moved on to like Logic or Ableton or anything? Well, like I started, that? When I actually started producing, I worked in Reason. Word, okay. And so, like, all that stuff, all the early stuff I did was Reason. Yeah. And then I got into Ableton Yeah. once I got with Ricky and everybody. Um, and so I've been using that for about eight years now. Eight years now? Oh, so you're, eight, like, a master years. in Ableton now. Yeah, I can move around really fast. Yeah. And then I jump back into FL just because, to me, FL just sounds better. Yeah. I don't know why I was talking to an Ableton rep the other day. I was like, FL just sounds better. I don't know why. Mm. So I'll d- we'll do a lot of the beat in Ableton, and then we'll dump it into FL. Could it be the sample engine? Like, or is it? It could be. I mean, I know it was developed in the beginning to be a video game. Yeah. And then people actually started making music with it. So there's probably some type of, like, natural limiter. Not the fruity limiter, probably something, like, on the master of it, period, that just sweetens it up a little bit to where maybe Ableton just gives you, like, a flat, you know, like a real one-to-one. Yeah. And Fruity Loops is trying to make it sound better because they're thinking, oh, they're on a laptop, so they probably got, like, shit boosted in it. I don't know. I feel like it's probably something like that. Because even when you turn mm-hmm. off the fruity limiter... You could just play a kick, and it just sounds better in Fruity Loops than it does in Ableton. That's interesting, because, like... I hear people get their shit knocking in Ableton. Yeah? It's like you got to do a lot of side chaining and different stuff, mm-hmm. which I'm still doing Fruity Loops anyways. But. I like Ableton stock plugins, like the like the uh, the glue, glue compressor. Oh, yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And then their EQ. I don't even look at their EQ in terms of sound. I just like it because it's just... It's a it's just a nice paragraphic EQ that I can just throw on something really quick. Oh, yeah, like, super just, easy. Yeah, so, like, but... That's a, that's an argument I've seen a lot that I never put too much stock into about which DAW actually sounds better. So you've noticed that FL sounds a little bit better than Ableton when yeah. you work. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And when I told her that, she was like, somebody was just telling me that yesterday. So I'm like, it must I know be it's not just me. Yeah. yeah. And so have you completely moved away from Reason? Yeah, I haven't used it in so long. Once okay. I got into Ableton, I just, we, I was, we were uh, rewiring it for a while. Yeah. And so we use them together, and then that just got to be a headache. I'm like, I don't even know why I'm doing this. So from where you started and where you're at now with the Five Points Bakery, Walt has an album out, by the way. Check that out again. Um, where do you see your sound going? Because, like, like, you start at point A, you get to a point where now you have bandmates and you do a lot of things live, but you also have the knowledge of, like, sampling. You've also been around a Kenny, um, to many others. Like, where do you where do you want to take it? Um, stylistically or is that something you don't even think about you're just like let's just make some dope shit and it'll take us where we ever wherever we're gonna go type shit yeah we're all sonic explorers so I feel like we all naturally are just pushing forward trying to find like the next thing yeah so sometimes we'll specifically talk about something like we just did this album that we're about to come out with called Sueño Azul it's just like a sleep album it's like 10 minutes we're doing it uh, with the homie of ours Neon Pajamas huh okay um we're just releasing it with them but uh, it's just like a sleep themed. He's done like this ten minute series. So it's like just do whatever. So we did like four beats and play for ten minutes. That's it's crazy. Just like a sleep vibe, but it's like our way, you know. And it's like a sleep album in terms of this is gonna help you. Well, make- I don't know if it'll make <laughs> you go to sleep, you know. But yeah, it's just I like do. it's it's a vibe, you know. And That's so sometimes dope. we'll like go for certain things, but a lot of times we just like try stuff. Okay. And just figure out like just try to get stuff to sound cool to us. So on top of being producers. You you guys are essentially y'all are sound designers, landscape designers. Oh yeah, like, absolutely. Yeah, we've yeah. done some sounds um, for Hollywood movie trailers. Word. Okay. And so we sold a bunch of sounds to a company out in um, L.A. And so they play some different trailers, like hits and crashes, and yeah, all types of like weird sounds. So we do like all types of interesting things, like break a Hennessy bottle, grab a sound of a lion, uh, you know, screaming, and then put an eight away under it. Oh, and okay. Then, like, put a bunch of effects on it, just have it sound like really fucked up, you know? That's and just crazy. have it when it hit black. Like, you know, it's like these really interesting textures and things. And so it's cool. So we do a lot of that in our beats too, just using sweeps and different things. Like, you hear it a lot in like our song arrangements, so like breakdowns and yeah, transitions and stuff. We do a lot of sound design in that. So instead of using a simple crash, it could be like that Hennessy bottle with the 808 under it type thing to like transition to like the next part of the song. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah, like something I do a lot is like when you freeze and flatten the sound in Ableton, if it has a reverb, there's like a tail at the end of it. We usually just chop it off and loop whatever's before it. A yeah. lot of times I'll take it and just use it as the intro and like reverse it. 
you know and i'll do that if i you know if i freeze and flatten 10 elements i'll just put all 10 of those tails at the front and so it goes shh, shh, you know just yeah which is different than just using a, re- a reverse symbol crash or something you know it's like using parts of the elements that are already there i think that's the dope part about just having having a group of people to work with because like you're already in a in a doll where like the dolls are like so limitless these days you can pretty much just do whatever the fuck but it's just it's cool to have people around because then like Walt or Anna could be like, oh, hey, why don't you take this, move this there, da, 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 da. And then next thing you know, you end up with a cool ass sound that you can just like sell to Hollywood, which I feel like is like an underserved. Is that like an underserved market right now? Like in terms of like sound design, like serving Hollywood? Because everybody, everybody's well, putting out packs of drums and, you know, but. Well, they have big, you know, a lot of this stuff goes to the major companies and corporations out there. Um, oh, okay. I just happened to meet a guy who's a music supervisor who had a company that yeah. does sound design. So they're out there, but you just have to like really look and you know try to find them. Yeah, I don't know if it's like underserved, but uh, it's definitely dope to to look at and, like you know broaden your horizons because mm-hmm. we do a lot of stuff like me and Walt mix and master as well. Um, there's a lot of different things. We shoot videos, pictures. Yeah. Just, do a bunch of different things. It's always good. I feel like if you're creative in one avenue, you can be creative in other ways. Yeah, you know? it's just like, do you want to take the time to learn how to do the thing? And speaking of broadening your uh, horizons, I did notice too that you guys are on Beat Stars now too, as well, right? Oh yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. So, Beat Stars and License Lounge. And License Lounge. Okay. Mm-hmm. How long have you? Uh, how long have you guys been into the uh, the beat licensing game, or is this new for y'all? Maybe eight months or a year. Maybe it's pretty new. Okay. Just figuring it out try to upload a, at least a couple tracks a week how do you like it has it has it proven to be just cool or is it just like it's cool i think we're just figuring it out because you know you have to really to be effective like run a lot of ads and do all different that things stuff. and yeah. we're we're right now about to start putting out a lot of different content like showing us working maybe might do some tutorials i'm not sure yeah i do like a master class we're just kind of debating on different things with mm. just putting out a lot more content you know because when people see us work they're like, yeah really mind blown at just kind of how we just move around and so I just want people to see that more. Um, and then just to teach people, you know, just different ways of making music. I think it's just fun. There's so many different things you could do, you know. Like, there's nothing wrong with adding, like, two sounds and drums. Like, that's highly effective and, like, right to the point, you know. But there's also other ways and different things of, you know, like, arrangements and sequencing and just dynamics and, yeah. I don't know, just exploring. Like, if you listen to an Outkast album, you're always gonna hear something different every time. Like oh, you can yeah. listen to it. You can listen to a Quim, and I've I've listened to it hundreds of times, and I can listen to it right now and pick out something I've never heard before. Hmm. I love that type of music. You know, it's yeah. not like it's just like overstuffed or whatever, but it's just so fresh. There's always like new elements and it just feels alive. You know, I feel like now that we can do everything, we should just be pushing and just trying new shit. Okay, and um, well, I guess. Uh because I, I know you got some moves to make as well, too. Um, if you can, just kind of wrap up with, of course, the cliche question of um, advice for producers that are out there, whether they've been producing for a couple of years and they're, you know, trying to figure out what their next step should be or those who are just doing it for the first time. I know there's like two separate, but. <laughs> yeah. Um, just find your sound and you find your sound through, uh, you know, your influences. Like, when I first started making beats, they all sounded like DJ Toomp and 3-6 Mafia. Word. It's like, you could clearly see those are my two favorite producers, you know? Yeah. But it's like, you keep working, and you find your own sound, eventually, if you keep working and keep exploring and, you know, putting different things together and just trying stuff. So I say, just let that be your priority. It's just, like, find your sound. And then once you feel like you got a sound that's, like, fresh and bringing something to the game, then link with somebody that's, like, on your level. And a lot of people want to get beats to T.I. and, you know, Uzi Bird, whoever. It's like... It's probably somebody in your neighborhood that's cold and ready to grind that record and do mm-hmm. something, you know, like find somebody's doing something for themselves and like go partner up with them and like, you know, create a sound and do something. It's like when we first started working with Scotty, I was oh, like, yeah. we got this dope sound. We need an artist to really get it out with, you know. So we started doing a lot of stuff with him and that went really well, you know. Yeah. Ritz was the same way. Um, but I think just finding your own sound and then finding somebody to get that sound out with. And then learn the business if you're going to be in the music business. Oh, facts. Yeah. There's a lot of, like, basics that are out there if you just care. It's like, there's really no excuse to sign bad paperwork these days. Yeah. Like, before you sign anything, get a lawyer. You know, make sure he's referred to you by somebody who's 
Yeah. Reputable. Sure. You know? <laughs> or reputable, yeah. Not the party that you're doing the business with, you know? Um, and just, you know, take your time. Don't rush into things. Okay. Um, tell them where they can find you one more time. Uh, at DJ Burn one DJ B-U-R-N-O-N-E. And then uh, thefivepointsbakery.com. That's where all of our stuff is at. All right, cool. Well, we're here with DJ Burn One. We are out. All right, man.